What I've been sharing with you, brethren, is based on my experience when I was very sick with COVID, which I spent eight days in the hospital and six of those eight days in ICU. And I told you how uh, deep the sickness was and the difficulties I faced in the flesh. And at uh, some point, I was too weak to to even be able to walk. I couldn't be even dress myself. I couldn't uh, oil my body. And uh, then I was rushed to the hospital that time and I spent that time in the hospital. But while my flesh was weak and failing, I realized amazingly that my spirit was so strong and closer to God than I had noticed when my flesh was strong. So I noticed that when our flesh is very strong, we may not easily know the state of our spirit. It can be a blessing and it can be a challenge. Because when our flesh is strong, we can sense the state of the spirit and our spirit may be very malnourished and we will not know until we find ourselves crossing, then we'll realize that our spirits were not fed. They were not taken care of. And that is one reason why uh, the Bible encourages us from time to time to fast, to take um, actions that will subject the flesh so that you are able to sense the state of the spirit and draw closer to God. It is good when God occasionally allow certain things to come to the flesh that are not pleasing to you, those things will really help you because it will make you know the state of your spirit. Many human beings discover the situation in which they are at the point of their death, which is so dangerous because they can cross over without, without being in the right state. So the lessons that I learned during that period I've been sharing with you. The first thing is that the amazing peace of God that I had, which I shared with you, particularly I titled it that God is looking for a quiet soul to fellowship with, not an agitated soul and a lack of peace. And God has given us peace as a way to measure our closeness with him, a way to determine whether we're in God's will or not in God's will. That is very important, brothers and sisters, and we look at that peace of God. But before that, I also pointed to you that you will notice the importance of having a clean mind, a clean heart, and have unforgiven everyone also at that hour. And be careful the kind of messages you listen to, the kind of things you feed your soul with, the kind of people and what they tell you be very careful because like I told you that time, at the very last minute, you might be crossing over, leaving this world. And somebody might just give you a message in that last minute, you may be sick in the body and the person comes to you and, and tells you, one prophet told me to tell you, and the person could even be the prophet himself who calls you and says, actually it is, one member of your family, your uncle or somebody who is doing this to you. He might not call a particular name. And as soon as you hear that, you put two and two together. The uncle who looks at you in a certain way or maybe someone you've clashed in the family with in the past, you immediately say that, aha, uh -huh, it is that person. You have already nursed bitterness in your heart and unforgiveness. At that state, you will not be able to cleanse your heart and you may die in that state. And that very last minute, that so-called prophet has succeeded to direct you to hell and twist your way from heaven to hell. Because Jesus says that if you do not forgive, your heavenly father will not forgive you. So we saw that some messages and some words that people come and speak to you, so-called encouragement, at a time when you might even pass on those words, they must sound like the people who love you, but Satan is using them to deviate you from the way of God to the way of the evil one. 
So we learned that. We learned the path of peace, the way of peace. And that was very important because the lack of peace in your heart is a sign that you are not with God. Today, I want to begin with the love of God because one other thing that God taught me in that state is his love. Love that does not depend on our material state. Love, the love of God has nothing to do with material status in the new covenant. So the first thing I want to begin with is that every Christian has a twofold ministry. And always be careful that you are executing these twofold ministries. The first ministry is towards God. In fact, uh, let us read in Matthew 22. Matthew chapter 22. When the people came to Jesus and asked him, which is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered them in Matthew 22, which I like us to read. It is in... Um, verse let, let me let me look for it if you find it you can let me know yeah it's in verse 34 matthew 22 34 but when the pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together verse 35 then one of them and they gathered together then one of them a lawyer asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What they were asking Jesus, they wanted Jesus to split the commandments of God and give preference to one and leave the others out. Then they will accuse him by saying, "Aha, uh -huh. he is not keeping the law of Moses. He is preferring some aspects of the law and breaking other aspects of the law or promoting the breaking of the law. And that's one of the accusations that they accused Paul, the apostle, and they wanted to kill him in Jerusalem and God protected him and moved him out because he had a ministry to Caesar. So they asked him this question, which is the greatest commandment? And they thought that he would err, not knowing that he is the one who gave those 10 commandments to Moses. Now, this is his answer in verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He says, the greatest commandment is one made of two parts. Number one is love the Lord your God. And number two, verse 38, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus is saying, you have a, a ministry of love towards God first. Then you have a ministry of love towards mankind. And you don't reverse it. It must start with God, then man. And later in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus narrows it. He says the judgment, the last judgment, will be based on how the children of God were treated, how Christians were treated, how you as a believer treated your fellow brother and sister. We have looked at this before, that the second part of the great commandment, which is love your neighbor as yourself, applies to the world, the general creation, the general mankind. But you know that when it comes to the church, Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. That is even a greater love than love your neighbor as yourself. Because Jesus defines the love with which he loves us like this. He says, for no greater love has anyone than to lay down his life for those he loves. Which means that when you love the worldly people, you love them the way you will love yourself if you were selfish. 
But the message of Christianity is self-denial. A Christian is not selfish. But if you are loving the world, you love the, the, the people of the world, you love them the way you would love yourself. But if these people are not in Christ, the, the word of God for them, like to the Pharisees, is love your neighbor as yourself. The way you love yourself with passion, love your neighbor also with the same passion. What you don't want your neighbor, what you don't want your neighbor to do to you, don't do it to your neighbor. But when it, it comes to the brotherhood in Christ, we are selfless. And Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. That is the ministry. All of us are called to exercise the ministry of love. Primarily towards God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. All your heart is the center of the decision making in your, in your whole being. It's called your heart. That is where your will sits in your soul. You must love the Lord your God with that. That is allow God to take over. You see, one amazing thing about love that we can learn from the crooked love that is on earth, the corrupted love that is on earth between man and woman. One amazing thing that we can learn from it is that when someone is carried by that love, he gives himself over to the one he loves. When a woman loves a man, she gives herself to that man. When a man loves a woman, he gives himself to that woman. And when he gives himself to that woman, he can give anything else to that woman. If the woman asks for his house, he gives it. The woman asks for anything, his car, he gives it. He tells the woman, I have nothing else that I keep for myself. Everything that I have is yours. Jesus said, all that the father has is mine. And all that is mine belongs to the father. That is love. That's the love that exists between father and son. And now, when we love, we love like that. When we say we love God, everything that is in us will be given over to the Lord. And that is what the Bible tells us in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. A second Corinthians 5.15, sorry. In second Corinthians 5.15, listen to what it says. It says he died for all. Jesus died for all. So that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and rose again. That is love. If you love God, you will live for God. If you love Jesus, you will live for Jesus. Living for Jesus is the ministry towards God. When you love Jesus, you long for Jesus. And you want to do what pleases Jesus when you love him. That is the meaning of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, that is with all your will. You have no will of your own, you do only the will of God. I've just given you an example of the corrupted love on earth. When people say they love and they are carried by that opium of love, do you know what happens to them? They do the will of the one they love. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. If you love me, you do my will. The mark of love is that we do what the one we love wants us to do. And if the one we love also loves us, he will also do what we would desire to be done, provided we know what is good for us. The problem with mankind is that we are so limited that we don't even know what is good for us. But God, knowing all things, decides and does what is best for us. So that's the ministry towards God, the ministry of love. The second is ministry towards mankind, which is also the ministry of love. That is, you will love them the way you love yourself. What you wish to give to yourself, you should wish it to them too, and do it to them. If you want them to do something to you, do that thing to them. 
That is a, a less level, a lower level of love than in the church. Love one another as I have loved you. And this is the way I have loved you. I lay down my life for you. Therefore, lay down your life for the brethren. That is the love that a Christian has for a fellow Christian, especially in the local church. And that is the ministry towards God's people. That is whenever you are doing something for a Christian, you are doing it as a sacrifice of your own self to that person. Whenever you want to do something to a Christian, you give your all to that Christian. That is, you do it in such a way that the Christian will feel that no other person would do it the way this brother has done it to me. That is the love towards the brethren. You lead, basically give your life for the rest of the brethren. That's the way we are supposed to live as brethren. So there are these two ministries. Now the problem is that we can be carried by one of these and neglect the other. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, what does all your soul mean? Every emotion in you must be to the glory of God. If you display an emotion in you that is ungodly, that, that is a proof that you don't love the Lord your God with all your soul. For example, please let me say this. If you love the Lord your God with all your soul, there will be no room for depression. Depression is an emotional disease. It's a disease of the soul. Mental diseases, what they call mental diseases in the last days, are diseases of the soul. And those diseases of the soul can progress and even affect the body. And when they are manifesting, it's a sign that God is not in control of your soul. You have not given your soul 100% to God. You worry in certain areas of your life. Therefore, God is not in possession. You have not loved the Lord with all your soul. That is why there is, there is this sign that your soul is away from God and God does not have access to it. And because you are in charge, your soul is agitated. That is a problem. When you love somebody, you give the person your soul. And that is the person to whom you give the soul is God only. Then God directs whoever you might then be close with here on earth. That's soul to soul connection. Then the last is love the Lord your God with all your mind. What you think about, what you meditate on. Your mind must be given over to God so that when a wrong thought comes in your mind, you cry to God to say, Lord, this mind does not belong to me. It is yours because I've given it over to you. Help me so that I don't think thoughts that are against you, that I don't think thoughts that are contrary to your ways in the name of Jesus. And this is the way you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is difficult. It takes grace to live this kind of life of love towards God. And God has to pour this love in our hearts first, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, before we love him with it. And before we love the brethren too, especially the love that Jesus said we must love the brethren with, it must come from God. But love your neighbor as yourself. A natural man can attain that level of love. I can tell you that there are people in the world who try to do that. That is ministry towards God. Then there's ministry towards man where you'll be carried by activities of trying to bless man here and there. If ministry towards fellow man carries you much more than you get close to God, something immediately gets wrong with your Christian life. Because you first have to be with God. You first have to minister towards God before you minister to men. Something like what Jesus was, was talking to Martha when Martha complained about Mary. That Mary has left her to be the one to do the cooking in order to feed human beings with it. To feed the, the physical Jesus with it. But Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, connecting to Jesus. 
the spiritual side of things. And Jesus said, Martha, you are worried for nothing. What you are doing is right, but you are doing it the wrong way. Mary has chosen the best part. Mary has to first fellowship with the Lord before serving the Lord, before serving God's people. Now, let us look at Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. And verse 14. Mark 3, 14, it says, sorry, I'm on chapter 2, Mark chapter 3, verse 14. Listen to what he says. Let me start from verse 13. And he went up to the mountainside and called to himself those, and called to him those he himself wanted. He wanted some people and he called them to himself. Take note of the word to himself. So Jesus is interested in calling you first to himself. That is the ministry of Jesus Christ. Every believer is not called towards the pastor, towards a prophet, but towards Jesus, to himself. This is the desire of Jesus Christ, to have you to himself. And uh, they came to him because he can call you and you will not come. He will not force you. He will not run after you. Like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and Jesus says, sell all that you have, give to the poor and you come and follow me. And that man went, went away sad. Jesus did not say, oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, can, can we negotiate? No, Jesus let him go. When Jesus calls you, he gives you the condition of discipleship. You reject that condition. He doesn't come after you. He lets you be. The condition of discipleship is in Luke chapter 14 from verse 25 to verse 31. That is the condition to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And please, if you think you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, check that you fulfill those conditions. Because Jesus did not come to call people to fill a church, 10,000 member church. No, he came to make disciples and be very sure that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ and that you fulfill the condition that Jesus laid down in Luke 14, 25 to 31. And when he calls you and you come to him, please do not confuse being in the church to be in Christ. They can be two different things. It's true that when you are in Christ, you must be in a local fellowship. But there are many in these last days who are in churches, but they're not in Christ. But they think they're in Christ, but they're not disciples. Jesus is only interested in disciples. He said in Matthew 28, go and make of all nations my disciples, from verse 19. When you make them my disciples, you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be, I'm with you till the end of the age. So Jesus says we should go and make disciples. Not church goers. Not people who come and fill the church and begin to shout, Lord, 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 Lord. But they are seeking their own. Not going after Jesus. Not after the heart of Jesus. The Bible says he called those he wanted to himself. And thank God they came. There are many people in church whom God is desiring to call to himself, but they are refusing to come here. They are in church. They are seeking their own. They are seeking material breakthrough. They are seeking prophecies and all of those schemes and healing. But they are not after Jesus. They don't love the Lord. The Bible says, let him, he who doesn't love the Lord should be a curse. Let him be a curse if he doesn't love the Lord. There's a curse upon those who are in churches who do not love the Lord. Who are not, who are not fervently towards Jesus with love. There's a curse upon them. 
I'm not the one placing a curse on you. It's a scriptural curse that says, if you do not love the Lord, you are cursed. It's not that God is angry at you because you don't love the Lord. It is simply that your lack of love for the Lord cuts you off from the Lord. And because of that, you are on your own. And therefore, you are a cursed one. So they came. He called them and they came. They did not resist him. They came. And we thank God for that. Now, now look at verse 14. Then he... Then he appointed 12. For what purpose? That they might be with him. And that he might send them to preach. Do you see the two reasons why he called them? Reason number one is that they might be with him. He called them to himself and they came and he declared that I'm calling you so that you might be with me. That might means you have the option of going back if you don't want to be with me. If you don't want to marry me, I can't force you to marry me. So they might be with him because he will not force you to be with him. Even now as we are talking, if you want to remove your heart from Jesus, you are free to remove your heart. Jesus will not force you. But he longs to have you with him. And when you come with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, then the next thing is, he tells you, I want you to be with me. The reason I'm calling you is that you might be with me. If you want to be with me, it is what I want. I want you to be with me. Just to be with me. Just to be with the Lord. Have you ever noticed that that is your calling? Just to be with the Lord. And then he, that he might send you to preach occasionally. What is preaching? God's people. So the biggest part of you, your ministry, is to be with the Lord and then to minister to God's people. There are two aspects of being with the Lord, brothers and sisters, listen carefully. There is the individual aspect of being with the Lord where you close your door and you fellowship with the Lord, you and the Lord. And there's the corporate aspect of being with the Lord where you come together in fellowship with the rest of the brethren and you be with the Lord. That is what Jesus said, I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. If two of you agree. So there are these two aspects of being with the Lord and that is built on the love towards God. While we, all of us individually and collectively as a church seek to be with the Lord, then we get grace from the Lord to minister to God's people. That is why gifts of the Spirit are given. But we find ourselves in a situation where in these last days, much emphasis is on the gift of the Spirit than on God himself. And people are now running after the gift of the Spirit. When they hear that a man of God is doing miracles there, they start to run after that. But that's not our calling. We are not called to that. Praise the Lord. So I want to say that I was also, my heart was, and as it is always carried by the brethren, I love the God's people. I've always said this. And those of you who are close to me, you know how much by God's grace, I love God's people. From the time I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I suddenly realized that the people of God are my people. I began to say strange things to my own blood family members. I remember I told them that I don't want to be too close to them and get a disappointment in the last days because if they're not going to where I'm going to, I want to be closer to those who will go to where I will be with Christ. And the truth is, I was so attached to the brotherhood, to the church from the day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I realized that there was now a gap 
between even my blood family members who are not close to Jesus. There was a gap. I didn't despise them. But I had to maintain a gap. My heart was, for some reason I cannot explain, was so attached to the brothers and sisters in church. And when something is happening to the brothers and sisters, it will touch me deeply. I usually weep for brothers and sisters. I weep for them. When something is touching them, I feel that my own people are touched. Something is happening to my own people. My people. God's people are my people. And I love it like that, even up to today. I once told you, my wife and I, we stay in South Africa. As, as soon as we, the Lord raised people with whom we fellowship in the Lord, we never miss Cameroon. We don't miss, there's no other place we call home as long as the brethren in the Lord are around and we're looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And we, we stayed from 2007, my wife stayed, and we only lastly went to Cameroon to visit Cameroon in 2019 or 2018, late 2018. Just imagine that period, about 11 years, she never said, oh, I miss this, I miss that. Because we are complete in Christ. If Jesus will throw us anywhere and say, stay here, and we know he's with us, we are at peace with him. If he allows us to visit a place called Cameroon, we visit. But I want to tell you that I miss nothing. I miss nothing when I'm in the brotherhood. And... This is what Jesus can do. That is being in close fellowship with God's people. When you love, you suddenly realize that you have a new family. And it's not strange to me because I'm going to spend eternity with some of you. For eternity, I'll be with some of you. But there are some of my blood brothers and sisters who are not in the Lord, they are not serious in the Lord, that I may never see again when I leave this world. I have a concern for them, the same way that God is concerned for them, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But apart from that, I know my brothers and sisters, my true brothers and sisters, in the Lord. Once upon a time, the blood brothers and the blood sisters of Jesus and his blood mother came when he was preaching to people who were eager to listen to him. Jesus, they, they came and they stood outside. They would not even come in to hear the word of God. They sent someone, go and tell him that we are looking for him. Jesus sent a message back through the same messenger. Go back and tell them that the, who are my brothers, who are my sisters, who are my mothers? They are these ones who hear the word of God and put in practice. Those who are willing to do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters and my mothers. What a, what, how joyful I am, brothers and sisters, that here in this small Holy Covenant church, the Lord has given me brothers, the Lord has given me sisters, the Lord has given me mothers in South Africa. And wherever I go, if I, God takes me out of South Africa to another place, he will do the same because he made a promise that he will give us these things hundredfold with persecution. And I love it like that. And I praise the Lord. But I get carried by it. And there are times that we may not be sensitive that we're neglecting the Lord. That is why occasionally God will put you in a situation where he will give you a break just to step in and say, I long for you. I also want you. You are giving more attention to my people than to me. I want you too. And brethren, when I shall be concluding this message on the love of God, I'll tell you what I learned. I did not know that God wanted me so much more than I wanted him. Do you know that you as a believer, you think you want God, Lord, I need you, Lord, I need you. God wants you too because he loves you. 
And this is the lesson that God taught me. He opened my eyes to see the revelation of his love differently. I had known it written in the Bible. I, had, I could preach it, the love of God. But experiencing it in a way that he opens your eyes to see what his love means is something else, brothers and sisters. And that is what I'm sharing. Using scripture so that your faith should not be based on my experience, but on the written word of God. That's why I use scriptures. Now, I want us to go to Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah is one of the minor prophets. And Zephaniah chapter 3 is a prophecy about the very last days. And I, I want us to read something there. Chapter 3 verse 17. We usually neglect these minor prophets and uh, finding them becomes difficult. Whatever you neglect when you want to look for, you might not easily see. So we have to be careful. Zephaniah chapter three, verse 17. And brothers and sisters, any of you who find a verse whenever we are sharing the word of God, and there is a verse, you find it. If you are the first to find it, just unmute your microphone and read it. Verse 17. The Lord your God. This is a prophecy concerning the time that Jesus is about to come. The time of the coming of Jesus. Listen to this. It's something that you can claim, although it's in the Old Testament. But it's a prophecy pointing to the coming of the Lord. When you read the whole chapter, the Lord your God in your midst, the Lord your God in your midst is Emmanuel, God with us. That was fulfilled in Jesus, which means that it is talking about those amongst whom God is, Jesus Christ dwells with. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. God saying that he will rejoice over you with gladness. I pray that God will give us a little insight about God's rejoicing with gladness. Brethren, it is not a sin to imagine how God will look like when he is glad. I don't know whether he... He, I don't know whether God will jump or what, but how does it look like when God is glad? God will rejoice over you with gladness. That is at a time when God has prepared you for his coming. Then he will rejoice over you with gladness. Do you know what he's talking about? When God the Father looks at the bride of Jesus Christ, well prepared, he rejoices with gladness. He will rejoice over you with gladness. And he will quiet you with his love. There's something about the love of God. It quiets the soul of man. Remember, when we're talking about peace, I told you that peace flows from love. The love of God is the one that produces the peace of God. This quieting you with his love is referring to God's love producing peace in you. Those who do not experience peace are the ones who have not allowed the love of God to flow in them. It's because they are blocking God. They are, not, they are not giving themselves over to God so that God can rule over. And therefore, they don't experience the love of God and the peace of God does not come upon their life. And peace inwardly will produce joy outwardly. When he says in the last days he will quiet you with his love, it means that the love of God will be poured out. 
that will result to much peace even when the world around us is in chaos. Look at the time we are living in. In a lockdown, in corona. See the time we are living in. In unemployment, inequality, poverty. People go about looting and so on. And can you imagine that these things we are seeing are going to go worse? In in 2019, 20, 2017, 2018, 2019, God spent time telling us and warning us about difficult times ahead. Then when we enter 2020, there was a message that God was giving and in the middle of the message, he stopped us and he said, let's go over and teach about his coming judgment. And during those period, the word was He's just shall live by faith. He's just shall live by faith. That was the solution. Do you know what? As we began 2020 and God was warning us the difficult times that lies ahead as we enter March, we began to see things happening. And there in March, before the lockdown, the Lord gave us a message that he's using this disease to make a distinction and also it is the hand of the Lord against the wickedness of man in the world. And there, the Lord also told us a number of things which somebody reminded me sometimes back. The Lord warned us all of this. Now I'm telling you this because it is in the midst of this that the Lord will give his love that will produce peace in the hearts of people, those who belong to him. So if in the midst of this you are agitated, I tell you, brothers and sisters, you must ask yourself the question, are you close to the Lord? Are you close to the Lord? So he will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Imagine God is singing over you because he has succeeded to have access to you. And he, he has worked in you and made you ready for his son Jesus. And he now quiets you with his love. That is, he uses his love to produce peace in your life immediately as Jesus is about to come. I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, we are so near the hour of the coming of the Lord that all of us should make sure that our hearts have been overtaken by the love of God and that the peace of God is being produced in our hearts. The mark of the one whom God's love is over, such a one, the one whom God's love is in control, such a one will always be at peace despite what happens here on earth. What happens in the economy? What happens in the political system? Whoever is in government or not in government, that will not make a difference because the love of God in your heart will not be shaken as God the Father will be shaking everything that is shakable on earth. He told us in 2018 and 2019 that it's about to shake everything that can be shaken so that what is unshakable will remain. And I remember those messages. And do you know where our peace comes from? When we yield to him totally and his love is not in control. Yielding to him means yielding to his will. Whatever happens to you, whatever comes your way, when you pray, you say, Lord, take it from me. He doesn't take it. You say, okay, Lord, if it is your will, I'm willing to live joyfully with it. Like Paul did in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And let me show you that this is referring to the end time. Verse 8. Look at verse 8. Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. What is God saying here? This is Armageddon. When all the nations gather in the valley of Megiddo in Israel against the coming of the Lord Jesus, 
Some of them will not know that Satan is using them to fight against Jesus and they will gather their thinking they are fighting Israel. This is what God is saying here, which means that God is saying in this last days, this is what will happen. But those who belong to him, he will quiet them with his love. And look at verse 11. In that day, you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds. Wonderful. All the sin that you've committed in the past, you'll not be ashamed about for it anymore. Do you know why? God will have wiped it out. In Jesus, Matthew 1, 21, you shall call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Do you know when I will remember the foolish thing that I did in the past? I will not be ashamed anymore. I will just be filled with thanksgiving for what Jesus has done. Free me from my sins. You will not be ashamed for your deeds. All that you did in the past, you repented. You gave yourself to Jesus. You will not be ashamed anymore. For the last days. And he says, in which you, are trans, you transgress against me, you will not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgress against me. For then I will take away from your miss. Listen to those whom God is going to take away from our miss. And this should be our prayer. I will take away from your miss those who rejoice in pride. In your pride. Those I will take away from your miss those who rejoice in pride. I want to read this from you. Living Translation, verse 11. On that day, you will no longer need to be ashamed, for you will no longer be rebels against me. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from amongst you. This one is clearer. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from amongst you. Father, in Jesus' name, if amongst us there are people who are proud and arrogant and they don't want to humble themselves and let you rule, take them from amongst us. They are not needed in amongst us unless they want to humble themselves. The one thing that the Bible says God opposes is the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And be very careful when you go to churches and they preach in those churches and exhort you they want you to be on top of the world. That's not the Christian message. For I will no long, if they would, listen, when he removes the arrogant people from amongst us, do you know what will happen? There will no more, there will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. There will be no haughtiness in the church of Jesus Christ. What is haughtiness? Haughtiness is the attitude that exalts the person and despises other people. That is when you feel more important than any brother or sister in the local church, you are haughty. That's haughtiness. Do you know how many haughty Christians are around? And do you know what? how many messages that are preached today to push Christians to haughtiness? God says when he will remove the arrogant, the proud ones from amongst us, there will not be any haughtiness. Nobody will despise another in God's house. As I'm speaking like this, is there anyone amongst you who still think you are more important than another because of your certificate, because of your beauty, your handsomeness, the clothes you wear that others cannot wear like that, the car you drive? And that's foolishness. You are the ones that God will remove from his church so that haughtiness will be gone. Verse 12, those who are left will be lowly and humble. Those who are left will be lowly and humble. Those who are left in God's church will be lowly and humble. Better submit yourself to humility and lowliness of life and resist all those preachers who tell you not to be lowly, but you think high of yourself. That is not from the Lord. That's not the new covenant teaching. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28, 29, 30, learn from me for I am lowly and humble at heart. Let us read it so that you know that that is this, what, what God is saying here is that he will remove the arrogant and proud ones, the ones with demonic spirits from amongst God's people and, re, and put the spirit of Jesus in the rest. 
I pray that the spirit of the Lord Jesus will be so deep amongst God's people, among the elects of God, that there will be no haughtiness in our midst. There may still be someone who thinks, ah, because I preach well, I'm better than the one who doesn't preach. Because I drive a car, I'm better than the one who walks on foot. That is stupidity. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. Other version says, I am humble and lowly in heart, or humble and gentle in heart. It says the same thing. That's the spirit of Jesus. Any preaching that wants to exhort you and lift you up is not the spirit of Jesus. That is what God promises that in the last days he will do in the church. He will remove the proud ones, remove the arrogant ones, and earmark them for judgment. And the remnant will be lowly and humble, will have the spirit of Jesus. And we praise the Lord for that. Let us all seek that spirit and let that spirit rule us. That's the spirit, that's the nature of the Holy Spirit. Those who say they are baptized in the Holy Spirit and they are haughty, that must be the spirit of the Antichrist, not the spirit of our Lord Jesus. We, the Lord once showed us in the series that he gave us about that man of sin, the Antichrist, his nature. The key aspect of his nature is that he will exhort himself. God is not looking for such people. God resists such people. So he will quiet us with his love. And I'm saying that he is doing it now. Open your hearts and God will take away that agitation in your soul and make you calm and you live at peace and you realize that peace is better than money. Peace is better than breakthroughs. Peace is better than any material prosperity that can ever be preached because most rich people die for lack of peace. But Jesus says, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Praise the Lord for that. So now this is what God promises his love to be. But you go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, I want us to read something there. That is the old covenant, the way God displayed his love in the old covenant. Now look at it from verse 12. Listen, let me read from New Living Translation. If you listen to these regulations and faithfully obey them, the Lord your God will keep his covenant of unfailing love with you as he promised with an oath to your ancestors, to our forefathers. So if you listen to the Lord, now this is Moses speaking concerning the covenant that God has established with his people. It is called the old covenant. He said, if you listen and do the terms of the old covenant, God will keep the covenant of his unending love with you. He, as he promised with verse 13, he will love you. Listen to this. He will love you and bless you. And he will give you many children. Brethren, how many children do you have? He will give you many children. He will give fertility to your land. Your lands will be fertile. In those days, business was landed business, agriculture. Today, it means your business will be fertile, right? And any business you are doing will be fetter. Your business will be fetter. And your animals will also be fetter. When you arrive in the land he swore to give your ancestors, you will have large harvests of grain, new wine, olive oil, great herds of cattle, sheep, 
goat, and so on. Brothers and sisters, verse 14, you will be blessed above all the nations of the earth. That's you'll be superior. You'll be above and not be below. You'll be top. This is the old covenant blessing. The old covenant love. God displays it. And how does it manifest itself? There are many other passages that I would have loved to show you how the old covenant blessing manifests itself. The old covenant, how God shows his love in the old covenant. He makes the people materially wealthy, healthy. He doesn't allow them to get sick. He makes their womb fruitful. They, they bear many children, physically speaking, and so on. Now, this is what God does in the old covenant. But now, in the new covenant, you go to Luke chapter 6, verse 27 to 28. Luke 6. Now, Luke chapter 6, verse 27. Listen now. This is Jesus preaching. And strangely, this is what he says. But I say to you, who here love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who spitefully use you. And I want us to read Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy 23, 4 to 6. You see a contradiction between the teachings of Jesus in the new covenant and the old covenant blessings and his teaching. Then you will know that when you go to places where they take you to the old covenant and they're asking you to confess certain things, you, the reason why the Bible says you will fall from grace if you follow such. Deuteronomy 23, verse 4. Listen to verse 4. Let me start from verse 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even in the ten, to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Baal, from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God will not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Now listen to verse 6. You shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all the days forever. Now this is the old covenant. Then you come to the new covenant and Jesus is teaching Pray for your enemies and do good to them. We come to Matthew chapter 5. Listen to how Jesus explains this even further. How we must live as new covenant Christians, new covenant believers. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that, that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Don't seek peace, the peace of your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Brethren, may the Lord not find you in any church cursing your enemies. You will have cut off from him. That is not a Christian teaching. Bless, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Brethren, I praise the Lord that by the grace of God we are keeping this and I hope we are. 
that anybody you think about that this person is my enemy, this person considers himself to be my enemy, you pray for the good of that person. If the person is sick, you reach out, you do good to that person. I hope you are like that. Listen, he says, Jesus says, so that you may be sons of your father in heaven. That's the mark that you are a son of God. Now, let me tell you something. The Jews were surprised when Jesus stepped in and began to call God his father. No Jew, there's no place in the Old Testament where an, a human being is referring to God as his father. There's no such a place. In the Old Covenant, only angels and direct creations of God are called sons of God, like Adam and angels. But no man born of a woman would dare call himself son of God. Jesus came and he said he is the son of God. That is where trouble started. Then the people who believe in Jesus, Jesus said that they, they have the same heavenly father like him. That's a new set of teaching altogether. That God in heaven is now looking for people who will be like him. But in the old covenant, he blesses them with material things, but he is not making them like him. Now in a new covenant, God wants to make you like him. Through Jesus. Now in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, where he says all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That passage in verse 29 explains what the purpose of God is. The purpose of God is that everybody who comes to God will become like Jesus. And Jesus will be the firstborn. And they will be the brothers and sisters of Jesus. This is God's plan. And this is God's plan for you. That's what God wants of you. To be like Jesus. And it is in this respect that you can see the love of God manifesting. And he says, listen, verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. In the new covenant, God is preparing a people to perfection. In the old covenant, there's no perfection. Wonderful. This is the reason why you need to understand the love of God properly. If you go to the old covenant, you will not be able to understand the proper meaning of the love of God. And uh, you will see that. In uh, Philipp uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 19, the Bible talks of not putting your mind on early things. And also Colossians 3, 2, not putting your mind on early things. But in the old covenant, God is blessing them for early things. If you are to bless a pig, how will you bless a pig? By giving the pig those dirty things that the pig likes. The pig, as the pig is eating and digging the ground and finding those dirty things, the pig will be praising you for what a wonderful blessing. But what God wants to do is different now. He wants to transform the pig so that the pig can become a different being altogether. If anyone is in Christ, it's a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. That pig nature of man that is used to digging the ground and going after materialism, God is transforming it to look like heavenly being, angelic being. Wonderful. Jesus says that at resurrection, we'll be like angels. That is what God is preparing us for. Therefore, the love of God has a different direction now and is higher. And brothers and sisters, this is what Peter did not understand in Matthew 16. Verse 21, when Jesus began to talk about him going to the cross to die, Math, uh, Peter's mind was in the old covenant blessing of materialism, health in the flesh, defeat of our enemies, and being superior on earth. Peter was surprised that this man who is so holy, whom God should exalt because he's so holy, he doesn't sin, this man is talking about going to the cross to die like a criminal. Peter was saying, what kind of gospel is this? He had to call Jesus by the side and began to rebuke Jesus. Don't say this kind of thing. You don't know what the old covenant says. You don't know what God says through Moses, that people like you must be exalted. Jesus said, get behind me, you Satan. You are an obstacle 
You are not an opposition to the will of God because of what you are saying. And he began to tell them that whoever wants to come after me must deny himself. If you hang on your life, you lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you gain it. He began to preach things that the disciples could not understand. But when the Holy Spirit came, they began to understand. Not only did they be begin to understand, they also preached it in the letters. That is the new covenant message. And this is what the Lord is teaching us. It is in this context that you must understand the love of God. Next week, I'll give you the scenario of a young woman who is given in marriage. But before that, I will tell you how much Jesus loves us and how much God loves us. Now, when you look at these apostles, Peter says, silver and gold I don't have. Paul says that he lived in hunger, in needs. You can get that in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 from verse 1. And in Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 to 13, he says all of that. And you ask yourself, did God hate his own servants? Did God hate Peter who declared silver and gold I don't have? Really? Did God hate Paul, a wonderful servant of God? Really? No. That is why if you do not understand the love of God properly, you may be frustrated in your Christian work and you may even give up. Now, let me conclude with this for today. Our security in the Lord is based on our understanding of his almightiness. If God is almighty, then nobody can defeat God. Our understanding of his all-knowing, his omnipotence. If God knows all things, then he knows us. Jesus says, my sheep follow me and I know them by name. I know my sheep by name and they follow me. So Jesus knows not only all things, but he knows you particularly. Number three, God loves us because you might think, okay, God is not all powerful. So we need a mighty prophet, a powerful prophet to come and help God to free me. No, he's almighty. You might say, all right, he's almighty, but he doesn't know what I'm going through. He knows all things. And now, does he love you? You might say, well, maybe he doesn't love me. No, I need to show you in the scripture how much God loves you. And if God is almighty, all-powerful, he is all-knowing, and he loves you supremely, the way we'll see next week, then if anything happens to you, is for a purpose, is for your good. But that good is not in the flesh. That good is in your spirit and your soul. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Jesus says, you, you have to do all to save your souls. All the preachers who preach, preach the same message. Not saving the flesh, but saving the soul. It is your soul God is interested in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word and we bless you for today. Lord, I pray that our eyes will be open to your love so that we may know what truly your love means for us. So that, oh God, we will not be moved by what happens to our flesh. Because Lord, when the proud man comes, when the wicked man comes, those who do not know your love might be wondering whether you love them because of what will be happening to their flesh, because of how your servants will be dying, even as they died in the past. But Lord, I pray that we will know what your love means. In Jesus' name, amen.